Otherwise, I'm going to forget. All right, accepting people from the waiting room now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Connecticut Medical Advisory Council Spring Meeting. Before we begin, it's my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Kat Evans, who is handling the technical production um, and will share with us our disclaimer and briefly resume, uh, review the Zoom etiquette. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Please take a moment to review this disclaimer as this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on ALF's YouTube channel. This online educational program is being delivered on the Zoom platform. In order to eliminate background noise today, only the speakers, microphones, and cameras are enabled. Everyone else is muted. For optimum viewing, we do ask that everyone be in speaker view. So please expand the view menu in the top right corner and click speaker. During the presentation, if you have a question, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on chat. Then simply type your question in the chat box. You may enter questions at any point during the presentation. The speaker will answer questions at the end of the program. Once again, we remind you that this webinar is being recorded. All attendees will receive a link to view the video via email for on-demand viewing and sharing after the program. Thank you, Kat. Before I hand over the um, program to Dr. Assis, I'd like to take a minute to recognize our sponsors for uh, this evening's meeting. With us tonight is Joe Guerreri from ASI. Welcome, Joe, and thank you. Um, we also have with us Megan Welsh. Um, and Chris Fr Frizzle from um, Exalexis, and Camille Adalumo and Dr. Tripti Mehta from Octopharma. Tonight's webinar is also being supported by Yale New Haven Health. And now Dr. Tripti Mehta from Octopharma is going to share a few words with us about plasma transfusions. Dr. Mehta? Hello, Kathy, and thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you. So hello everyone, as Kathy mentioned, my name is Tripti from Octopharma Medical Affairs. And today I would like to provide a brief message on the topic of plasma transfusions for hospitalized patients with liver disease and liver transplantation. Plasma or FSP from the hospital blood bank is generally used to prevent or treat bleeding in these patients who can't make enough clotting factors. And we are aware that the potential adverse effects of plasma transfusions include transfusion transmitted infections or trolley, which is transfusion related acute lung injury or allergic reactions. And the question is, how can we help reduce the risk of these adverse events? Currently in the US, there are virus inactivated plasma products available to help protect the blood supply. The pathogen inactivation methods include SD, or solvent detergent treatment, which can be applied to pooled plasma, which is then aliquoted into 200 ml bags and stocked in the blood bank, similar to FFP. Or another method is a photoactive chemical with ultraviolet light using a special device. But this method is applied to a few plasma units at a time, so requires more steps. The mechanism for SD is that it disrupts the lipid envelope of viruses, such as HIV, hepatitis B or C, or other known or unknown enveloped viruses. So the virus can't bind and infect cells. The SD treatment is actually a well-known virus inactivation method that has been used since the 1980s. And it is, a, it is applied to pooled plasma to minimize the risk of transfusion transmitted infections so that you have an added safety measure compared to standard plasma. And interestingly, this pooling process of plasma also has the potential for diluting out anti-HLA antibodies or allergens that may be responsible for non-infectious transfusion reactions, such as trolley or allergic reactions. 
So the takeaway message has been rightly stated by these authors. It is time to raise the bar for the safety of the blood supply, since we now have the means to do it for plasma transfusions with solvent detergent treated pooled plasma. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to share this message with all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maida. And now I turn the program over to uh, Dr. David Assis. He is the Medical Advisory Council Chair for the Connecticut <clears throat> Medical Advisory Council. Dr. Assis. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for attending. Um, on behalf of the entire Connecticut chapter of the ALF, I'm really happy to introduce Maybe you. Maybe, Bill. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Uh-oh. Um, and we're very excited to have such a great attendance. Um, I think the speaker goes without saying is a world-class educator. I think there's a lot of um, interest now in UFOs and if the Martians could tune into this, I'm pretty sure they would, <laughs> as they're renowned um, worldwide and also in our community. So we're really happy to have Guadalupe Garcia Salar as our speaker tonight. She's the professor of medicine and digestive diseases at Yale, uh, chief of digestive disease at the West Haven VA, past president of the ASLD. And as anyone who's ever heard her speak as a wonderful educator um, and, um, top-notch clinical researcher and scientist on cirrhosis. And so she'll be speaking to us today on the management of decompensated cirrhosis. Thank you so much, Lupe. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Uh-oh. Yes, we can. We oh, can okay. hear you. So, so hi, everybody. And I thank the ALF and David for having invited me to give this lecture. Uh, it is really my pleasure. I wish I could see all of you um, face to face, but I I feel you, all right? So I'm gonna talk about management of decompensated cirrhosis and I always, uh, almost always start with this next slide, which is that it sets the stage of where we are. So any chronic liver disease leads to cirrhosis, but now we know that at the very least, we have to talk about two stages of cirrhosis, the compensated and the decompensated patient. And it's only when the patient decompensates that they're at risk of dying. The compensated cirrhosis is a long asymptomatic stage, while decompensation is defined by clinically overt complications, variceal hemorrhage, ascites, overt ascites, encephalopathy, and joints. Not minimal encephalopathy, but overt encephalopathy. And uh, they're entirely different disease entities. The median survival in the compensated cirrhosis exceeds 12 years. While once the patient becomes it, this median survival is around two years. Now, for the three main events that are, um, are, are the main um, three main decompensating events, the main driver is something that we call clinically significant portal hypertension or CSPH. And this was defined based on clinical studies that measured the hepatic venous pressure gradient or, or HVPG and normal is three to five, more than 10 defines clinically significant portal hypertension. And this is the way this would work. In cirrhosis, you have the initial um, alteration is regenerative nodules, fibrous tissue. In addition, there's also an active uh, vasoconstriction. This leads to increasing resistance that is felt right away by just increases the pressure. This is mild, so HVPG goes from six to 10. Uh, this is enough to um, make the plasmic capillaries generate more um, nitric oxide and other vasodilators. So this leads to splatnic vasodilation. So blood is now, the splatnic capillaries are vasodilated. There's more blood into the gut, more blood out of the gut and into the system, into the portal circulation. And this increases the pressure to levels more than 10, that is CSPH. And it's only then that these collaterals, portal systemic collaterals, mainly the most important ones are varices form. Uh, but at the same time, this vasodilatation leads to an effective hypovolemia. So the baroreceptors feel like there's underfilling, this activates neurohumeral system, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, the sympathetic nervous system that, cause, that leads to sodium and water retention, hypervolemia, increased cardiac output. So there's a, a, a hyperdynamic circuitry state that increases the flow even further. Additionally, these neurohumeral systems are all vasoconstrictive, so they further increase the resistance by causing vasoconstriction of the intrahepatic vessels. Now, in the setting of having an increased pressure in the sinusoidal and sodium and water retention, you will have ascites formation, which is the, the most common decompensating event. If this flow increases and these collaterals get bigger and they eventually rupture, giving way to variceal hemorrhage. And finally, in the presence of portal systemic shunting, 
you may have encephalopathy. This one also has a contribution of liver insufficiency. So of the decompensating events, and this is a, a, a study by Gennaro D'Amico, you can see that of the four decompensating events, ascites is by far the most common, followed by variceal hemorrhage. In terms of, of, the, of, of the mortality that each of these events carry, ascites, again, by far, is the one that's not only more common, but is the one that carries the highest mortality. So I'm more afraid of a patient that comes in with ascites and a patient that comes in with variceal hemorrhage because we know how to control that and the mortality is not as high. So this is important to recognize. So if you think about it, rather than, therefore, rather than preventing variceal hemorrhage, what we want to do in a compensated patient is to prevent decompensation. That is, we want to prevent not only variceal hemorrhage, but ascites and hepatic encephalopathy. And uh, in the patients, now we know how to subdivide this group. And we have the patient with mild portal hypertension. These are very unlikely to decompensate. And therefore, in, in these patients, we concentrate on eliminating the etiology. And in these cases, actually, there's the possibility that we you could reverse to a non serotic state. But patients with CSPH have thicker septa, they are unlikely to reverse to a, to a non serotic stage, and they are likely to decompensate. So it's these patients that we are going to concentrate on if we're going to want to prevent decompensation. And how would we do that? By lowering portal pressure. So we have for many, many years known how to lower portal pressure. Um, Non-selective beta blockers are the mainstay for more than 35 years, and they act at the level of increased flow. So the traditional non-selective beta blockers for panel and natal act by number one beta one adrenergic blockade that decreases cardiac output. But actually the most important effect is beta two adrenergic blockade that leads to splachnic vasoconstriction. This is a more direct effect that has a, more of an influence in decreasing flow. Now carvedilol is, is a particular type of non-selective beta blocker that in addition to having these uh, effects also have alpha one adrenergic blockade effect. So the, it's, a, it's a vasodilator. And we think it may act by vasodilating the intrahepatic circulation. What we do know for sure is that carvedilol has a greater portal pressure lowering effect than propanol or natal. So it's a more potent um, drug. And because we're talking about preventing decompensation, I'll show you the seminal study, this is the PRODESI trial that looked not only at variceal hemorrhage, but they looked at the probability of developing any decompensating event. And these were all patients that were totally compensated. They had CSPH, that is they measured the portal pressure and they had more than 10 and they had no or small varices. They did not include patients with large varices because it would have been unethical to randomize them to a placebo. So these patients were randomized to a placebo versus a beta blocker, two thirds got propanol, one third got beta blocker. And you can see here that the principal outcome was significantly lower, that's 49% lower in the beta blocker group. And if you looked at the, at the decompensating events, ascites was the event that by itself was significantly lower in the beta blocker group. There's a first trial that shows that we can actually prevent the worst complication of cirrhosis, which is ascites. And it went from 20% in the control group uh, and only 9% in the beta blocker group. Additionally, development of, remember these patients had no or small variance, so the development of high-risk variance was 40% lower in the beta blocker group. And in post hoc analysis, it seemed to be that carvedilol was more effective than propanol, which you, you would expect because it lowers the, the uh, portal pressure more. So just um, that's, that is now just to let you know that we can prevent decompensation. Now to the topic. Let's talk about variceal hemorrhage. We, we all, I start with variceal hemorrhage because that's the one that is the most studied because we portal hypertension people were dedicated to and obsessed with variceal hemorrhage and we left the other decompensating events um, sort of behind. So we know, I've, I've spoken about this, the other factor that happens when someone is bleeding is that you may have an increase, and actually even in patients that are not bleeding, there's bacterial translocation and this, by causing inflammation, also contributes to this splachnic vasodilatation. It happens more in patients with, um, with the variceal hemorrhage or with any GI hemorrhage. So uh, where, what are the strategies and where do they act? The first thing is these patients, remember, are hypervolemic, and that leads to bleeding. So you do not want to tank them up too much. So do not overcharge. Obviously, if a patient is coming in with hypovolemic shock, you want to resuscitate them. But if they're not, then try to not overtransfuse. The other things we give antibiotics, this is general measures. 
uh, to prevent bacterial translocation and, and ameliorating this vasodilatation. And then we want to use intravenous vasoconstrictors to cause splactic vasoconstriction. We're talking in the US of octreotide. We do not have somatostatin or totally present. We do not use non-selective beta blockers in this setting. No, I've seen a patient recently that was put on IV labetalol in an outside hospital. This is not going to work. We're going to blunt the, the, the cardiac response to beta blockers. And additionally, they will not have the response of these more potent vasoconstrictors. And then, of course, in this setting, ligation is very useful because you're going to ban the, the varics or varices that are bleeding. Now, TIPS is second-line therapy, and I will go um, in more detail as who are the patients that are candidates for TIPS. So these are the measures that I just talked about. These are the standard of care initial measures before we even decide on, 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 on doing an endoscopy. One, this is in place. One has to do an endoscopy within 12 hours. And we it, once variceal hemorrhage is confirmed, and this is the way this is confirmed, is by either seeing a varix that's spurting blood, that's no question is from the varix, or you see a varix that's, that has a, a clot or fresh blood around it, or you have a varix with a white nipple sign, which is an area where, where there used to be a clot. Notice that I'm not looking at red whale signs. Red whale signs are an indicator of a high risk of bleeding, but not an indicator of someone who has bled. Nevertheless, if you find varices, even if they're without any signs, but there's no other lesion that would explain the bleeding, you have to say that this patient is bleeding from varices. Now, so after you've confirmed this, you do an endoscopy, you do ligation of all the varices that are there. Uh, one continues that IV based active drugs and the, and the antibodies for two to five days, mostly towards four and five days. If there's no bleed, this is the, the standard, which the majority of patients do not bleed. You discontinue the IV drugs, to start non selective beta blocker. The issue is, if the patient, at the time of endoscopy, you cannot control the bleeding, is not controlled with ligation, or even you cannot even ligate the varices because the patient is profusely bleeding, this patient needs a salvage tip. This is, this is life or death. On the other hand, you've controlled the bleeding, but during hospitalization, the patient re-bleeds. This patient has failed standard of care, so you need to do a rescue tip. All right. Now, who are these patients that, that need the rescue tips? Mostly child C patients. So the sickest of the sick are the ones that need rescue tips. And if you think about it, they have bled once, they have bled twice. Now you're putting a tips in there. They have a very high mortality. So high mortality in patients that get rescue tips. Now, and so the issue is, what about it if these high risk patients, we put a tips in preemptively. So patients at high risk of failure, we put in a P-tips when the bleeding is controlled, but before they re-bleed. This is P-tips and it's placed before the patient fails and needs a rescue tips. Obviously, these two instances, you don't care if the patient has heart power and cephalopathy or not. You don't care about contraindications to tips because this is life or death, all right? Now, However, in the preemptive sense, you have time to think that the bleeding has been controlled, but now within the first two, three days, you have to put a tips in, but then you can evaluate the patient. And these are patients that have traditionally been excluded from P-TIP studies, old patients. Of course, I already talked about child Pew score 14 and 15 because they are very sick. Recurrent overt encephalopathy without precipitating factors, uh, kidney failure, sepsis, Importantly, heart failure and pulmonary hypertension, so you need to do a cardiac echo, HCC beyond the line criteria, and complete portal vein thrombosis, which currently would probably not be considered a contraindication. So let's show you the, the, the studies, the, the two main randomized controlled trials of preemptive TIPS in patients with um, uh, that in patient with child C. And so in the in the first study by Garcia Pagan, they included child C. 10 to 13 points. So they excluded, like I said, 14 and 15 points because they are too sick. But they also included, and I think they included them because they didn't have enough patients to randomize. So they included patients with child B that were actively bleeding at time of endoscopy. And you can see here, this is survival. This is not only re-bleed, but it's survival. Preemptive tests had a significantly better survival than standard of care with drugs and ligation. Now, the, the, there were 50-50 patients with each of these categories, but the one-year absolute risk reduction was 25%. That's pretty significant. Then came the Chinese. These were, um, these were 
again, a lot of patients, almost double the number of patients or more than the Garcia Pagan study, but they included the same child C, but they also included child B with or without actively, and so all child B patients. And in fact, only 22% were the really high risk patients. So nevertheless, they did show that PTIP had, had, was associated with a better, a significantly better survival, 50% risk reduction in dying. But there, the absolute risk reduction was only 13%, which is lower than with, when you select sicker patients. Now, these were mostly hepatitis C and alcohol cirrhosis. These were mostly hepatitis B cirrhosis. We do not know what happens in NASH cirrhosis with preemptive TIPS. Um, there's an additional Scottish study that included even a small number of patients. They were all um, alcoholic cirrhotics. Um, they did not find differences in survival as opposed to these two studies. And actually what they found is that you could not put that TIPS in in those first hours and that um, sometimes the TIPS was not feasible. So there's more of a real life study. So because there's been a lot of studies, most of them um, retrospective uh, cohort studies, uh, a recent made analysis was published in gastroenterology. Uh, they included the two studies that I've spoken about, Garcia Pagan and Lu, um, and that used the, the, the current standard of care because Monesillo also um, was a randomized controlled trial, but he included uh, patients with uncoded tip stents and they use HVPG as a, um, uh, as a decider of who entered into the study. You can see this is all patients, this is survival and it favored preemptive tips. Now, because they had individual data, they could now see the subgroups. So in the child seat 10 to 13, no question, P-tips was better than drugs plus endoscopy. When they looked at child B, they separated into two groups, B seven points, plus active bleeding, and then child B more than seven points, meaning eight and nine points plus active bleed. And the differences were not so in, the, in just the seven. It was, however, significant in the B more than seven. So these are the two that groups that they identified as being high risk and that would benefit, would have a survival benefit with preemptive tips. So this is the way it plays now. When the patient comes in, you figure out, is this a tips? preemptive TIPS candidate or not. So you calculate the trial score. If you decide that this patient is a P-TIPS candidate, this should be placed within 72 hours. And that's why all these studies used to be called early TIPS, but it was, it was a little confusing that term. So these are our candidates based on this Nicuara Farsal Melanaz that I just showed you. But I still think that the child B patients are not very well. Uh, we haven't quite settled who are these, but at least we know that they have to be the sicker child B patients and they have to be actively bleeding at endoscopy. The non, it's important to recognize who are not P-TIPS candidates and child A, not a single child A will ever be a TIPS candidate. Child B7, with or without active bleed are not candidates either. So these are the, the, the healthy patients, but you'd also do not want to include the very sick child C patients. So it now, uh, and then you have to put the pre tips within 72 hours. In the majority of patients that did not receive a tip during admission, then you go to the, to, and, uh, to the normal um, uh, schedule. If they bleed, you get the rescue tips. If they do not bleed, you have to discharge them on secondary prophylaxis with non-selective beta blockers and ligation. And let's talk about that. This is, there's been a million trials looking at prevention of re-bleeding, and it's not as safe. So first bleed rate is rather sm small, 15%, whereas if you do nothing in a patient who's bled, 60% are gonna re-bleed. And the main therapy is a combination here of ligation and um, uh, non-selected beta blockers. And again, these studies, although they're like a million, never stratify patients by composite or decompensate, which is what we used to do in the past. You know, we never, we just say patients who have cirrhosis, have cirrhosis. But now that we know about this, we, we asked um, uh, the, 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 we did an individual data meta analysis, including four randomized controlled trials and divided them by child A, which are mostly compensated and child B and C who are mostly B compensated. And um, so these are trials that were ligation plus beta blockers versus ligation alone. Really in child A patients, it did not make a difference. But in child B and C patients who are the decompensated patients, 
the addition of the beta blocker definitely made a difference in survival. This is overall survival, and this was significant. Therefore, non-selective beta blockers are the key component of combination therapy, particularly in these decompensated patients. So now, this whole issue is it, it, the decompensated patients are going to be likely to have ascites. So, but it all depends on what type of ascites. And this is a, a, a great study uh, by Dr. Albillo's group that looked at patients with diuretic responses versus refractory ascites. They used propanol as the non-selective beta blockers. And they looked at heart function and, and renal perfusion pressure before and after propanol. In the diuretic responsive ascites, there was no decrease in heart function. There was a significant decrease in renal perfusion, but only one patient went below this threshold that, perfused, that actually perfuses the, the, the kidney. Whereas in refractory ascites, there was a significant reduction in, in systolic function and also a significant reduction in, um, in, in, in renal perfusion pressure, but actually 11 of these 20 patients went under this threshold um, of renal flow autoregulation, and four of them actually developed HRS, AKI. So be very careful. Of course, there's another half that did not um, develop this decrease in renal perfusion pressure. So there, there are some patients with refractory side that will definitely tolerate non-selected beta blockers. And this is based on the, on the mean arterial pressure or on the systolic blood pressure. So one has to A, it, use non-selected beta blockers very cautiously, maintain that mean arterial pressure over 65, or easier still is to do the systolic blood pressure more than 90. Now, what about tips in the setting of, of prevention of re-bleeding? You already, we spoke about tips in the setting of someone who's actively bleeding. Uh, so if you, this is the only trial that used covered tip stents, which is the one that is the standard of care type of stent. And you can see here that re was zero with tips and uh, much greater in patients um, who had standard of care ligation and, and beta blockers without differences in survival and without differences in, in treatment failure. But the problem is always encephalopathy. Patients with TIPS have a greater uh, possibility of getting encephalopathy, particularly early on. And this is the reason why TIPS is second line. So in whom can we use TIPS? I think we have to think of TIPS as really works. We just have to choose the patients better. And I'll talk about this also for a size. So if the patient's already on non-selective beta, well, you plan on putting the patient on, on non-selective beta, beta blocks in ligation, but the patient does not tolerate. Maybe the patient has refractory size, the blood pressure goes under 90. So then you go for tips. Don't wait to see, leave them on ligation alone. I would go for tips. If the patient re-bleeds, which is relatively common these days, we do the same thing as we start. You hospitalize the patient, you do these three center of care measures, you do the endoscopy with the ligation, but then, because the patient has already failed secondary prophylaxis, they have to go for TIPS, and this TIPS has to perform during that admission. They cannot leave the hospital and then think about putting a TIPS. They ha it has to be done during that admission. On the other hand, if you have an, another excuse to put a TIPS in, even if the patient tolerates a non-selected beta blocker, but the patient has refractory ascites, and you know that, like I showed you, they may not tolerate beta blockers where or they had complete portal vein thrombosis, uh, which could have actually precipitated the variceal hemorrhage, I would go also consider um, TIPS. So this is out of the recommendations. This is sort of off the top of my head where we're trying to put TIPS perhaps earlier. And in, in, these cases, in this case, it's emergent. In these cases, it's semi-elect. Now let's go to ascites. Like I said, the, 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 wor the, the, the most common and the one that carries the worst prognosis. And and it carries a worse prognosis because as whatever led to ascites gets worse, you will get more complications that are very significant. So initially, you have a high pressure in the sinus, so this leads to fluid leaking out of the peritoneal cavity, ascites formation. But at this point, these patients are more inflamed than the compensated patient. This leads to splactic and systemic vasodilation, a decrease in mean arterial pressure, activation of neurohumeral system. This leads to sodium retention, like I said, and this replenishes the volume so that fluid continues to be leaking into the peritoneal cavity. 
If the patient gets thicker and there's more inflammation, they're more vasodilated, decre more decreasing mean arterial pressure. Now this patient is retaining sodium very avidly and they're not gonna respond to diuretics. So now they get refractory ascites. If in addition, now you're getting ADH that is being secreted uh, as part of this neurohumeral system, you'll get water retention and this will lead to dilutional hyponatremia. And in its extreme, when this, these vasoconstrictive systems are maximally activated, you'll get renal vasoconstriction and hepatorenal syndrome. So you can see here that ascites, refractory ascites, hyponatremia, and HRS represent a continuum in the decompensated cirrhosis. So this, these complications here I call a further decompensation of cirrhosis. So what do we do now for the patient with ascites? We give them sodium restriction and diuretics. And I have to mention um, that on my first slide, the new ASLD guidelines for treatment of ascites, SBP and hepatorenal syndrome are out. They just came out over the week and they're in hepatology. The first author is uh, Biggins. Uh, and, but this, you can see that these act way downstream of the pathogenic cascade. They're symptomatic therapy. This is not pulmonary edema. This is just ascites. And not only that, if you decrease the effective arterial blood volume with diuretics, you will activate these your humeral systems more so that you can now get hyponatremia and actually a decrease in renal blood flow and AKI. In fact, pre-renal acetemia from overdiuresis is the most common cause of acute kidney injury in patients with ascites. So you have to be very careful in treating patients with diuretics. They cannot lose more than one um, pound a day. Now, what do we do for refractive site? That goes even worse. We, we, or with a size that's very tense and then patient needs to be comfortable, we stick a needle in there and do a large volume paracentesis, we take the fluid out. This is way, way downstream. And it has a problem in that it can lead to lactic and systemic vasodilation. This is called post paracentesis circulatory dysfunction. This in turn leads to decreasing the effective arterial blood volume, more activation of neurofumeral systems, and then hyponatremia and acute kidney injury that could actually go on to hepatorenal syndrome. So that's why it, with the LVP, what we do is we try to overcome these other factors and give albumin. Albumin will increase the effective arterial blood volume. It will probably even cause some vasoconstriction as it binds nitric oxide and it also binds cytokines that work with systemic inflammation. So albumin is now recommended with every paracentesis uh, more than five liters. So you get six to eight grams per liter of ascites removed. If the patient has AKI or is a high risk of AKI, one should try to avoid LVP or if you're gonna remove, remove less than five liters and give albumin even though this is not recommended for patients who do not have AKI. Now the question is, is albumin alone useful in patients with uh, cirrhosis and, and hard to treat ascites? And this is the ANSWER trial. This was a randomized control trial in which a group of patients got weekly albumin infusion. So they would come into the hospital, get the weekly albumin versus standard therapy. No, they did not use a placebo. And they looked at overall survival. This was significantly better survival in patients who got the weekly albumin. Not only that, um, these patients were, they were not, they were not diuretic responsive aside, but they were not refractory, somewhere in between. So they had lower rates of need for large volume paracentesis, less hyponatremia, less SBP, and less hepatorenal syndrome. So this sounds uh, fantastic. The problem is that it was not placebo control. So that these patients got seen weekly by their doctor, whereas these patients were seen whenever you see them every two to three months. So therefore, uh, you can understand that, that, that maybe just taking care of them every week made the survival and all the other complications less. More to come. The other study, and additionally, there's this MATCH study, uh, which also included patients with, with um, sort of not quite refractory ascites. This was a double placebo um, trial of albumin plus metadrine, which makes sense as a vasoconstrictor. And you can see here that there was no difference in survival and there were no difference in need for LVP, renal failure, hyponatremia, bacterial infections, and cephalopathy or GI bleeding. Advantage of this one is double, this is a better, better um, designed study. But uh, however, these patients were less sick. They had a median melt of 12. 
these patients were more sick. So one wonders whether it failed because they were sicker patients. But for now, this is the ASLD guidance. There was no recommendation that could be made regarding the outpatient use of albumin in routine clinical practice. So we have to wait for more trials to come. Now, what about TIPS? TIPS acts, acts upstream of the pathogenic cascade. And I'll show that. Oh, I did not show that in my next slide. So you are actually, you are relieving the site of increased resistance. And all the blood that's sequestered in its splachnic circulation is now going into the systemic circulation and you're increasing the effective arterial blood flow. So it acts upstream. And there is one, only one study again using covered stents, which are the standard of care now. And this study by Bureau in France showed that the survival, again, this is survival, was significantly better in the TIPS group compared to those that contain with large viral parasites and albumin. Now, it's important when you see these studies, if this is going to apply to your patient, you have to look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So they, need, they uh, uh, include patients that have at least two LDPs in a minimum interval of three weeks, not, no more, not, not more frequently than this. Um, they, they, they excluded patients who required parasitosis every two weeks or, or more frequently, all right? So every week, we're, or sometimes we think of this when they're requiring it every week, that is too late. Child score more than 12, they excluded, delivered more than six. Again, AKI or, or kidney dysfunction, recurrent encephalopathy, which is the main predictor of encephalopathy post tips is encephalopathy prior to tips. Again, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, uncontrolled sepsis, and complete poor veins on those. The, 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 if you look at it, the median of LDPs was 4.5 in the last three months. So they, they, these patients mostly had a parasitosis every three weeks. In, in a recent consensus conference that we just submitted for publication, we, we concluded that TIPS should be considered in selected patients with at least three LVPs for tensocytes in a year. That means every four months. So one should start thinking about TIPS much earlier than, 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 than we're thinking about it. Oh, this is the slide that I wanted to show you. You decompress the sinusoids, right? This is the TIPS. You transfer this blood to the systemic circulation. But the problem is that you get encephalopathy or liver insufficiency, you're stealing blood away from the liver cells. So how can we prevent this from happening? This was study that was just published this year in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It's again from the same group, Bureau in France. They randomized patients to placebo or rifaximin. They had to get the rifaximin in the two weeks. They started rifaximin two weeks before placing the tips, and they showed that, in fact, refactoring was associated with a lower probability of developing overt padding and velocity. When they looked, 81% had tips placed for ascites. Uh, I think that the varicell hemorrhage ones must have been patients that were uh, placed to prevent recurrent uh, hemorrhage. So the mean melt was 12. So think about this. These are like fairly um, good uh, patients in terms of the liver function and, and no kidney injury. And they found that in the post hoc analysis, those, those ben the people that benefit the most about this were patients that had previous hepatic encephalopathy, whereas in those without previous hepatic encephalopathy, there was no benefit. Now, uh, what is the other way that we can prevent encephalopathy is by putting a smaller tip stent, not a big one. So stents come in, in size of eight and 10 millimeters and, and people try to lower the pressure no matter what to less than 12. And sometimes they use a 10 millimeter stent. And this study um, that I had an opportunity to collaborate with when, when I was in, in, in Italy for, for, for trying to lead, uh, this was a study that random, it's not a randomized study, this was a prospective non-randomized study. So some pages, 20, got a six millimeter, and this was, a, six millimeter is pretty small, and um, the re, and 22 got more than six. It could be 10, it could be eight. And you can see here that that they they had the same rate of, of, of large round parasites. So they did not affect the efficacy of TIPS, but the encephalopathy, look, this is portal systemic encephalopathy, much lower in those that had the small six millimeter stent. In the SLE guidance, um, people are scared of putting six millimeter stents, but so what is a recommendation is that you want you to use small diameter coated stents of less than 10, meaning eight millimeters or lower. 
and are preferred to reduce the likelihood of post-TIPS complications, including encephalopathy. So, so this is just brand new. Now, bacterial infections are, are the bane of the existence of, of, of any patient with cirrhosis because it can occur in the decompensated or in the first decompensated patient and lead to multi-organ failure, renal failure prominently. And this is called acute on chronic liver failure, and it has a very high inpatient mortality. Now, this can also happen actually in the compensated patient, and this can lead to clearly to acute on chronic liver failure and multi-organ failure. So of these infections, 38%, the majority are, well, the majority meaning because the others have much lower percentage are spontaneous SVP, SBE, which is spontaneous bacterial empyema, which is when the hepatic hydrothorax gets infected and spontaneous bacteremia. So the main way to manage these patients is on admission and independent of whether the, if the patient has ascites, you do a diagnostic prior whether they have symptoms or not. If it's more than 250, you start an antibiotic. But you also have to be mindful of other um, evidences of infection. If the patient has SIRS or suddenly develop AKI or jaundice or encephalopathy, you have to pen culture and do, of course, the diagnostic paracentesis and um, start an antibiotic. Uh, in the new guidelines, we have a whole table of all kinds of infection. I'm just showing you the SVP, the, the, the cover combination for SVP, and it depends on whether the infection was community acquired or nosocomial. If it's community acquired for SVP, you do a third generation cephalosporin. If it's not nosocomial, we, we start with at least um, pip tassel and you add daptomycin if there's evidence of VRE or meropenem if you know that they have MDR gram-negative organisms. So what else can we do for these patients? If they already have these uh, risk factors for kidney failure, one uses IV albumin. And here, uh, we differ a little bit. The ASLD recommend 1.5 gram per kilogram at day one and one um, gram per kilogram at day three. I sort of disagree with this, but the authors of, of the paper were there and I could not overcome them. Patients with AKI and or Johns are more likely to benefit from albumin. And uh, I think the album you should be less and it should be guided by, by the presence or not of AKI. The British guidelines actually say that in patients with SVP and an increasing rising of in, in serum, an increase or a rising serum creatinine, that's when you use the album. And I would agree with that. I would, I would um, tailor the, the IV albumin to patients who are already demonstrating some propensity or, 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 or presence of AKI. Anyhow, so the, what we try to avoid when we do this albumin is to prevent hepatorenal syndrome from occurring. Uh, about 15 of the AKIs in cirrhosis is HRS. So don't think that right away, patient who has a high cranking has HRS. Most of them are perenal azotemias. And before you deem that someone has HRS, you have to rule out perenal azotemia um, and um, acute tubular necrosis. So what do we do? We use, once we decide that patient has HRS, we use vasoconstrictors so that you can actually act on this vasodilation and albumin, which I, as I explained previously, may have an action on effective arterial blood volume, vasodilation, and systemic inflammation. And turley pressing in the world is by far the most utilized vasoconstrictor and has been associated in this um, meta-analysis with an improved survival in HRS. Unfortunately, it is not approved um, in, in the US. And um, even though most of the patients in this man now come from the US trials, and this was the third trial, this was the confirmed trial. And this includes uh, patients with HRS. Um, they found that turtle present for the previous two studies had been negative studies. So this is the third, and third is a charm study that showed that terlipressin was more effective than placebo in improving renal function. So the, the primary outcome was something called verified HRS reversal, which is two consecutive creatinine values less than 1.5. It was very contrived, right? At least two hours apart and surviving without dialysis for at least 10 days. This was FDA requirement. So you can see here that there was clearly a p-value of 0.06. If you see there was more clinical success and less failures in the terlipressin arm. Now, in this trial, because they use the old definition of HRS, 
they define HRS as a, as a crediting of more than 2.25. And when we use now changes in creatinine as, as, as recommended now by the Ascites Club, you know, you could get HRS with a crediting of one or 1 1.5 at least. So, so, and the lower the credit, the greater the response to turtle So it's actually impressive that this study actually achieved a, 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 a verified reversal of HRS in a significantly higher number in, on turtle depressin. Um, but unfortunately, they used credit levels that were too high. And the problem was turtle depressin resulted in more adverse events leading to discontinuation of the drug, 12 versus 5%. And death within 90 days due to respiratory disorders occurred in 11 versus 2% in placebo. And based on this, the FDA gave um, the company a complete response letter, which is essentially a, a rejection with opportunity uh, to submit more data to see if with this data, it can be approved. So for now, Trillipress is not approved for use in the US. Uh, now let's talk about what happened. Not only did these patients have uh, more credit than we would expect in patients with HRS now, uh, number two, they also got a turtle depression, which would decrease the post load, post cardiac load. But these patients at baseline, before they were randomized, they already had three uh, alveolar levels of, that were 3.7 and 4.0 that you will never ever see in a patient with ascites or HRS. This means that the patients were being given. Uh, intravenous albumin. And while on therapy, they even got more albumin, one, around 200 uh, grams in each group. So this explains, if you're increasing the postload and you're increasing the preload, how these patients had more pulmonary edema. And this is a problem. So I think it had to do also with the type of patients that were included in the trial. Now, let's talk about albumin then. This was a study called the ATTIRE study. Um, in, they're both uh, published um, in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a randomized controlled trial of hospitalized patients with cirrhosis. And, and they claimed that if you kept their albumin total more or equal to three, uh, they were gonna have less infections, less kidney dysfunction and less mortality. So that was the composite primary endpoint. And as you can see here, they were identical. They were no different. The albumin group was no different than the startup care group that got albumin only with LVP or with SVP as, as per recommendation. And when you look at this, uh, at the, um, at the three components of the comp composite primary endpoint, there were again, no differences uh, between any of these endpoints between the albumin group and the standard of care group. Uh, when you look at this, obviously the albumin group got a lot of albumin, particularly at the beginning so that they could maintain this, this albumin level at around three. Uh, the cost obviously is astronomical when, when you do this. Uh, and the, so they got 200 grams in the albumin group, 20 grams in the standard of care group. And guess what? They got more adverse events in the albumin group, mostly based on pulmonary edema or fluid overload. So I think we've gotten to the point where we're using way too much albumin and we have to now be very mindful of that. And we, are, we, we desperately need uh, validation of non-invasive methods to assess blood volume in patients with decompensated cirrhosis receiving albumin, particularly when we're combining this uh, with turley press. So in most cases, basic contractions are temporizing um, events to transplant. So you, so you do the transplant. So what happens after transplant in a patient who has had HRS prior to transplant and responded or did not respond to turley press? And there's a European study. You can see here that actually there's no effect in terms of survival post-transplant but there is an effect of chronic disease post-transplant in that the non-responders to HRS, non-responders to early present have a higher incidence of CKD after. So it means that maybe these patients already have some kind of uh, not an atomic or, or non-functional kidney injury when they got the turtle pressing. So all these studies include mostly patients with hepatitis C and alcohol. The, all the studies that I've just shown you, the entire study, the confirmed study, we don't know what's going to happen now in the presence of NASH where patients may come in already with chronic kidney disease. So since we don't have anything to prevent the care, what are we going to do? We, are, we want to prevent 
worsening vasodilation. And we do that by giving Albion after LVP and with SVP, as I showed you, we have to avoid vasodilators and we have to carefully use non-selective beta blockers like I showed you in patients with refractory ascites. How about preventing infection as the main cause of worsening vasodilation? So there's two trials. One that has a small number of patients that show that norfloxacin uh, has a better survival in patients with SVP than placebo. Um, but importantly, that, that norfloxacin also prevented at least transiently hepatorenal syndrome. This is a, this, these are, I'm sorry, these are not patients with SVP. These are patients at risk for SVP. So these were, these, these were the, the risk factors. So this, it was a very sick patient. But then came another study more recently. It's, it's a multi-center with many patients. Uh, this is a, a, a well-designed study. The theory that was that norfloxacin was gonna be better than placebo in terms of survival. So this is the primary endpoint. It was a negative study. And again, they were high-risk patients. They were mostly child C patients. And you can see here how when you look specifically at kidney dysfunction, which is what I'm trying to prevent here, they were not significantly different, P.37. Therefore, at this point, there's no clear indication for use of norfloxacin in the prevention of kidney dysfunction in cirrhosis or as primary prophylaxis of infection. Now, what about the preventing a decrease in effective arterial blood volume, we have to carefully use diuretics. Patients cannot lose more than a pound a day. They usually you have to have less than one pound a day. You carefully use lactules. Lactules are adjusted to two, three soft bowel movements a day. It is not measured in milliliters. It will want to prevent variceal hemorrhage. And finally, you want to prevent acute kidney injury by avoiding NSAIDs, avoiding nephrotoxin, and cautiously using IV contrast. So um, to finish, I showed you that decompensated cirrhosis can be prevented by using non-selective beta blockers in patients with compensated cirrhosis and clinically significant portal hypertension. This is now something that's going to be so important. The main decompensated events are ascites and variceal hemorrhage. In a patient with acute variceal hemorrhage, to think of tips at the time of admission. So mainly these are child C10 to 13 points. The B are still to be defined. Non-select beta blockers should be used cautiously in patients with refractory ascites. Make sure that this SVP is more than 90. In difficult to treat ascites, both serial albumin infusion and TIPS decrease the need for LVP and seem to improve survival. We need more clarity on, on, on these two different therapies. Be cautious about excessive albumin infusion in hospitalized patients. I was just attending a month ago or so, and there was a patient that got albumin uh, with parasites, but every week or so, plus they were chasing this with diuretics, and she came in with pulmonary edema. So even in the outpatient setting. And preventing AKI progression to HRS is important in patients with cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and ascites. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia Sal, for a wonderful and robust presentation. At this time, we do want to enter a gallery view to give our audience an opportunity to ask you any questions. Sure. We're so lucky to have you here today, and I know you're super busy. So if you want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute yourself, or you can type a question into the chat box. I'm not seeing the chat box, so I don't know where it is. Oh, here it is. Would you place a tip in a high male page with refractory variable? Yes. See, so, so this patient, like I said, I don't care what the meld is, the patient's gonna die if you don't do something for, for him or her. So that's why I said, if you're doing a, re a rescue tip or especially if you're doing a salvage tip where the patient is bleeding like crazy, you don't care what the meld, you don't care what it is, you have to save that life in that moment so you put a tip. What were the side effects fairly pressing in the study? What study? The the it was mostly pulmonary edema. They, they were volume overload type of side effects in the in the confirmed study. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the only study I talked about. Sorry about that. Yes, the, those were mostly volume related, and the mortality was higher in those patients that had um, these side effects than in the control group. 
Lupe, what do you think the future of Turlip Crescent is around here, given? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, the Utah, David was actually in the FDA panel, right? I mean, we were very yeah. disappointed, but at the end of the day, you know, the vote was unequal, right? It was by one vote that, that it went to, to the FDA um, panel. Yeah. Yeah, it was and interesting. They, but, the... but, but, but the, what killed them was the side effects. Yeah. I mean, if you have a higher mortality, so... So I think that was the main thing. So they're waiting for more safety data. I think they're going to have to uh, figure out who are the patients. And I think it was it was a number of things. They have, you know, the cranium of 2.25 to be randomized. You know, the album that these patients were already getting, and then they got more. So that precipitated, um, you know, uh, volume overload. It was very unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine if it ever does get approved, it'll be even more important to avoid over uh, infusion of albumin because that's precisely something we don't think about enough. I know, I know, I know. We are like, I mean, at the VA, at least there's a restriction on how much. I think at Yale now you do as well. I, we may yeah. be swinging the pendulum the other way, but I think we, if we could have something that would tell us how much volume the patient is getting or how we, then we could tailor this much, much, much more carefully. So I have, what about, oh, Silvina, thank you so much. Uh, do you think there's gonna be some place for SGLT2 inhibitors in diabetic cirrhotic? And I think it's, it's gonna have a place. So SGLT2 inhibitors, in the same way that they're blocking the reabsorption of glucose, they're also um, blocking the reabsorption of, of sodium. So they're naturatic. And we um, have a, a, a three cases that were presented that had had a site that could not get a diuretic. They either got encephalopathy, hyponatremia, or AKI, and these patients responded beautifully um, to uh, one of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So um, we are about to start a trial to see what the pathophysiology of these are. Uh, for now, you know, I guess. You know, if you have a patient with diabetes, in whom it's the only population, I think it will work in diabetic and non-diabetic, but this is like off the top of my head again. But if, if right now you have a patient who's diabetic, who's not responding, one may try to talk to their primary doctor or diabetes doctor and see if they, you can start an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, how would you interpret the data for preemptive tests in terms of male score as opposed to child score? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I am a believer of child score. This child is a, a, a child score was developed, you know, by actually surgeons who looked at the patients. This is a child A, child B, child C. So it gives you child A is mainly compensated, child B is mainly decompensated, child C are further decompensated. So it gives you the stage of service by looking at the child class. Male was developed in already decompensated patients. It was developing patients who were getting tips. So you get tips only if you're decompensated. So it's not going to work for a compensated patient. So Actually, in the Chinese study, they, in a retrospective, not in the randomized control trial, but in a previous trial that was retrospective, they showed that the patients that benefited the most were those with the males more than 18. And people may have an issue with that. So, because that was not randomized, there were patients that were, you know, we're not sure about that. But the, all the data comes from child class. So it's not, so it's, it's really, I mean, it is sort of subjective, but it's work. And, and this is what the recommendations are based on the child class. All right. Uh, do you normally order procalcitonin admitted to hospital with ascites given the import of early antibody? No. Uh, the pro procalcitonin has not been shown to be very good um, marker of infection in patients with um, with cirrhosis. They they have either very, it's it's I I I, can't, I no one is using it really. So. I think, unfortunately, you have to use your clinical acumen to figure out if the patient is infected or not. And sometimes it is sort of difficult because they may be, especially the people with alcoholic hepatitis, you just have to, um, you know, um, pan culture them and so forth. There's nothing really. Uh, is there a study about different doses of IV albumin instead of one gram? No, unfortunately, I wish there was. Okay. Well, the question is, is there another study that looked at 1.5 gram per kilogram in our obese patients is a load of albumin, all right? So I beg them. So in the, if you look at the, the uh, if you look at the guideline, it says 
you know, one can choose to, to give albumin per AKI recommendations, which is, I made them put that sentence, made them, I suggested that that sentence is put there because they claim that because that was the IV albumin that was used in the, um, in the, oh, I'm blanking on the, on the sort, the first author is sort, in the sort study, that's what they did. And there's, no, and nobody is going to do a study look at different doses of albumin. I think, um, one day at the VA, they bury um, exactly 1.5 the first day and one gram the next day. And there was a guy that was 100 kilos. So he got all the albumin in the state of Connecticut and this patient got pulmonary edema for sure. This was many years ago. So I am much more cautious with albumin and this should be more cautious. And I, yeah, what can I say? Anyhow, uh, actually, but it's actually, how often do you move a patient to a higher level of care for not epinephrine for HRS? So we had an algorithm at Yale um, that was created when Brett Fortune was there, who I think is on the call. But so, so this we got a multidisciplinary team. There was the people in ICU, the nephrologists, everybody else, and we um, and we had an algorithm. So they would start our treatment in midstream. We would accelerate it for the next next three days because some patients do respond, a minority do respond. So if they respond to our treatment midstream, that's all set. And if not the ICU people would, would admit the patient for norepinephrine infusion. Uh, and we are still going to be doing this. The, the problem is that, you know, first of all, nobody follows an algorithm. And secondly, if the attending in the ICU wasn't aware of this, when you came in the next day, some of them would be on constant measures. So, so that was, you know, that was very disappointing. So, but I do think you have to give them the trial of tritinidine quickly. If that doesn't respond, then you have to talk to your ICU people. Um, for the pressing infusion versus bolus, no. I, in the U.S., that study was done with boluses, so the label is going to say bolus. Truly, pressing an infusion has less side effects and is as effective, and you use lo you use lower doses. But I don't know what if it ever gets approved. We don't know what what. Um, you know, the label is going to stay. All right. Thank you so much. Everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia Sal, and thank you everyone for submitting your questions. At this time, I'd like to bring back Kathy Flynn. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Garcia Sal. I know that you have another speaking engagement on an international Twitter debate. So um, we appreciate you being here. And again, thank you on behalf of everyone in the audience. Um, at this point in time, it's my pleasure to jump in and give you an update on the American Liver Foundation's um, Connecticut um, happenings. So some of our, our programs and events that have taken place, we had a rebirthday celebration on April 8th, where we gathered together liver transplant recipients who were celebrating their um, rebirthday or their liverversary, you know, choose your, um, choose your, your moniker. Um, but it was attended by um, over 40 patients and their caregivers, um, Dr. Mulligan from Yale New Haven Health and Dr. Glenn Morgan from um, Hartford Hospital both spoke about their respective transplant centers. Um, we had three transplant patients uh, share very touching personal stories about their liver journey. Um, and we even had entertainment to round out the event. Um, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, on April 24th, we uh, hosted our uh, Cuisine for a Cause event. That was a national event where we had over 400 people participate, um, and we raised over $200,000 for ALF's mission. So thank you to those of you who cooked along with one of the two celebrity chefs or made a donation to support this event. Um, and a very special thanks goes to our lead sponsors, um, EL New Haven Health and Hartford Healthcare. Um, on April 29th, three of our Connecticut Medical Advisory Council members, um, Sue Zapodka, Sarah Gillespie Haymond, and Simona Jacob, uh, presented a national patient education webinar uh, called The Journey Together. It was a palliative care program offered to um, patients with advanced liver disease and those who care for them. Um, I'm happy to say that there were over 125 uh, people in attendance. And then after, when it was shared on YouTube, there were another 178 um, on-demand views. So we're happy to get that information out on behalf of the American Liver Foundation. 
Um, coming up next is our Liver Life Walk. Um, this is an annual event for those of you who are not familiar. Um, this year, we added a little flavor to it, if you will, by offering a Liver Cup Challenge. Uh, there are going to be three awards um, presented one to the top fundraising medical team, um, one to the top recruiting medical team, and one to the top steppers. So I guess we are charting the number of steps that all of the team members um, take between now and June 4th. Um, the winner of the fundraising um, prize will get a liver cup. Um, most importantly, that institution will get bragging rights for a year. Uh, they will keep the trophy at their institution until the 2022 walk next year. Um, the top recruiting medical team and the top steppers medical team will um, receive a plaque to commemorate their efforts. Um, I certainly encourage uh, all of our um, Connecticut MAC members to um, join in this competition. As you can see on the leaderboard here, Team Yale is leading in, uh, it's in the top three in two of the three categories. And all, as you can also see, there are several teams who are close behind and in the hunt. So I encourage everyone to join the competition between now and June 4th. Um, on June 16th, the uh, Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Advisory Council will be hosting the Greater New York, New Jersey academic debates. Um, there are four teams who will be debating two topics um, and they have invited a team from Connecticut to participate. So Dr. Albert Doe, who I believe is present tonight, um, has agreed to mentor a team of fellows from Yale New Haven, and that's Dr. Lindsay Muir and Dr. Sayad uh, Safo. Um, they will be representing Yale, they will be representing Connecticut, and um, we invite you to attend the academic debates and cheer on the Connecticut team. Um, you'll see that the registration link is in the chat. We will also follow up and send that to you all um, in our email after this presentation. Um, also coming up later this year is our 2021 Liver Health Poster Competition. This is the second year that we are hosting this. Last year, you may remember, it was part of the Cuisine for a Cause event because it was so popular across the country. Um, we are making it a standalone event this year. Senior members of the medical community will be invited uh, to encourage their fellows or early career hepatologists or GIs to select a poster topic that appeals to them, create a poster and a short video presentation that communicates a complex liver health topic in terms that are easily understood by patients and the general public. Um, there will be a judging panel um, that will review all of the posters that will live on a, um, a dedicated website. Uh, this judging panel will select a winner from each of the six categories that you see here. Um, and they will award um, a winner in each category. We also will open up the website to the general public and they will have an opportunity to vote for um, what we will award as the People's Choice Award. So more information will be coming and we will be hosting a meeting for any of the um, senior members of the medical community who wish to uh, get more information and to bring back to their medical center or institution. That meeting will take place on June 22nd. Um, just to keep it in, in perspective, the submission period is uh, the months of August uh, to September, and then the voting period will be the month of September. The winner will be announced in October at our um, 45th anniversary Legacy Gala, which you see on the bottom right. Um, our gala will take place on October 20th. It will be an in-person event in New York City, um, and we will keep it as an in-person event as long as it is safe to do so. We'll also be um, you know, complying with CDC and local um, guidelines uh, about gatherings, but um, we're gonna keep our fingers crossed and hope it is safe to have a, a, a really uh, wonderful in-person experience. Um, I'm really excited for the Connecticut community because um, one of the honorees will be Dr. James Boyer, um, and we all know his long 
history with the American Liver Foundation. He is one of the founding members um, and he will be um, one of the honorees as will Dr. Uh, Wynn Arias uh, from the NIH. Um, and we will also be recognizing the Boston Athletic Association for their um, endurance partnership with us um, through the Boston Marathon. So it should be a, a really robust event and I do invite you all to um, join us. Our next MAC meeting will take place in September. We don't have the date or the speaker yet confirmed. Um, as soon as we do, you will receive a, an email invitation. Um, but we do have confirmation for our December MAC meeting that will take place on December 7th. And Dr. Glenn Morgan, the liver transplant surgical director at Hartford Hospital will be our featured speaker. Um, and we're really crossing our fingers and hoping that it is safe to gather in person. And if so, this meeting will probably take place over dinner. Um, once again, I would like to thank our uh, sponsors for this uh, program this evening. Um, I would like to thank ASI. Um, I would like to thank Exelixis, Okta Pharma, and also Yale New Haven Health. Um, thank you so very much for supporting this educational program. Lastly, I invite you to stay connected with the American Liver Foundation on social media. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, and if you are visiting our MAC meeting from some other location in the US and you're interested in learning more about joining a medical advisory council in your area, please reply to the email that you receive in the next couple of days with the YouTube link to tonight's presentation. Um, and we will gladly connect you with the ALF staff member in your area who oversees the Medical Advisory Council. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program back over to Dr. Assis. Thanks very much, Kathy. And thanks so much once again for Dr. Garcia Sal's participation and for everyone for Attending tonight's event, we're very excited to continue with these um, educational opportunities. As Kathy mentioned, when it's safe to do so in person, we will gladly do that. Although I think there's also a benefit, of course, to having some of our friends from around the country and even abroad participating. So perhaps there are ways for us to continue reaching others through our Connecticut chapter events. But once again, thanks everyone. Have a great night and we look forward to seeing you at our fall events. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Assis. Good night, everyone. Thank you.